Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I want to talk about the recently announced uh, discovery of a roughly Earth-sized planet orbiting Proxima Centauri in the, uh, I guess, the Goldilocks zone, uh, which ha is the distance from a star where uh, I think it's uh, liquid water uh, can uh, exist on the planet um, uh, unprotected, I guess. So basically, the equivalent at Proxima Centauri, what the Earth's distance from the Sun is. Now, this varies from star to star based on the brightness of the star and, and uh, that sort of thing. So while it's one astronomical unit is nicely in the Goldilocks zone around the Sun, it's a different distance at Proxima Centauri. It'll be a different distance at yet another star. Okay, so let's assume that they have found what they're suggesting they found a basically Earth-like size planet, uh, basically a rock uh, that's in the Goldilocks zone at Proxima Centauri. Well, let, let's just assume that's true. Uh, what is why is this exciting news? Well, for a couple of reasons. First. I believe it's the first such planet we've actually see, we've actually uh, potentially found, and that makes it big because while we were pretty sure these these sorts of planets had to exist around stars other than the sun, we had no no direct evidence of that. Now we've got reasonably good evidence that these types of planets do exist. Uh, and the fact that this one was found in, at Proxima Centauri, which is our nearest stellar neighbor, um, that would seem to lend credence to the idea that these planets are common. Now, we've got a sample size of two, uh, so that's not uh, statistically significant. We, we don't know that this really is a common thing until we find a lot more of these around a lot more different stars. But having found the planet at Proxima Centauri, it doesn't nix the idea that they're common either. Uh, and it it kind of backs up what we, pr we thought was probably the case anyway, that these things must be fairly common. Uh, now, I'm sure somebody's going to uh, listen to this and then point out that we don't think that they're fairly common or that's not the consensus or something like that. But if you look at the probabilities and you look at the makeup of the solar system and the fact we have rocks whizzing around all over the place here and, and things like that, the, uh, the notion that planets uh, like the Earth wouldn't exist around other stars is frankly ludicrous. Uh, the likelihood that the solar system here is unique in that it has rocks whizzing about is ridiculous. Uh, maybe an outside chance it might be the case, but it seems so vanishingly unlikely that there's simply no uh, no reason to go in that direction. It, it's much simpler to assume that the rest of the universe behaves very much like what we see here. If it doesn't, then all bets are off anyway. Uh, so having these things be common, uh, why would that be a big thing? Well, the more of them there are, the more likely we're going to find one that actually has life on it. And finding life on another planet will pretty much definitively answer, are we alone? If we find a biosphere elsewhere, that proves that Earth is not unique. And as a result, we can then pretty much assume that there is another planet somewhere in the vastness of the universe where intelligent life probably evolved. Now, if we find a planet with intelligent life or uh, life that's, you know, like say Stone Age or, uh, you know, pre-industrial or, or even post-space uh, travel, you know, like, uh, where they've just given up wandering around off their planet or something. But if we find a planet with a species that either has the potential to be intelligent or is intelligent, 
Of course, then we've answered the question that we're not alone. Uh, if we find some sort of, if we find biospheres on other rocks around other stars, then we can be reasonably certain that uh, we're not alone because if you've got these biospheres, the odds of evolution causing intelligence to come up elsewhere is pretty good if you got life in the first place. After all, one of the reasons humans have survived as long as we have on Earth is because we have a certain level of intelligence. Other species that have survived so survived well also have a certain level of intelligence. And also the fact that we have a certain level of adaptability. Uh, we can adapt to a great many circumstances. Like, for instance, I live in a cold climate. Um, it, you know, it's cold for much of the year. Uh, now, obviously, without tools and uh, that sort of thing, I wouldn't be living here. I, you know, humans would still be uh, in the uh, in the African savanna or something like that. Um, but we long since our ancestors worked out that we could, when we killed an animal for food, we could use its skin to keep warm. And things like that. And that adaptability is clearly an evolutionary advantage. Uh, so odds are that kind of adaptability, if it showed up on another planet, would lead to something very similar to us in level of intelligence. It might not look like us. Probably wouldn't, in fact, although bipedal would not necessarily be a, a ridiculous thing to happen. Um, it's no guarantee that that would be the case, though. So, uh, so basically, if these things are common, and it's looking like they probably are, uh, having based on the discovery at Proxima, and if this chain of discoveries develops and continues, then we can be more certain that we're going to find life elsewhere. Uh, it also means that if we do manage to get viable interstellar travel going, and by that I don't necessarily mean you can jump on a ship and go visit the neighboring uh, star and then come, come home uh, at the end of your vacation, but I mean actually just being able to get there, uh, even if it takes a thousand years. Uh, once we have that, if these planets are common enough, then it means that we have a good chance of sending out these generation ships, for instance, and getting to a, a, a star system that has a planet that we can survive on. And that would mean that humanity spreading out from this one basket we have all our eggs in called Earth to a whole bunch of other planets becomes viable. And even more so if they have compatible biospheres, which is not impossible. And, in fact, not entirely unlikely. Uh, the chemistry is going to be the same everywhere. So uh, odds are, if you got something that looks like life to us, it's probably going to be somewhat compatible, uh, at least chemistry-wise. So that means it's probably going to have oxygen atmosphere and that sort of thing. And it's probably going to uh, give us something that we can work with, at least within the technology we'll have to have to make a trip to another star which means we'll be able to drop down onto one of these, these planets with its own biosphere. And even if it's toxic to us, we'll be able to survive on there much better than we would on a rock we had to terraform from scratch. And it certainly would take a lot less time to get a colony up and running in a self-sustaining way as a result. Of course, this all does raise the question, if these, these planets are spawning intelligent life, why don't we see it? And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, and that's a much bigger topic all on its own, so I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, I'll just say uh, quickly that there's a lot of possibilities from we they're just too far away and we haven't seen their signals yet, to they're not putting out anything we can detect, to the possibility that we happen to just by fluke be the first. And, you know, all of that's possible in, in, at some level. Uh, but 
as I said, that's a massive topic. And I'm sure if you're interested in it, you can find stacks of videos and articles and so on on just that if you do a quick search on the interwebs. Uh, so really, there's one other aspect of this uh, discovery that is important, and this is probably the part that's the most exciting about it, and that is that it serves as a way to fire up people's imagination. Uh, the fact that we're seeing these planets, potential planets, on, at nearby stars that we can maybe possibly reach, uh, it could get everyone fired up to the point where it might spur research into how to get there in the first place. The technology we need to build a generation ship or some other propulsion technology that would allow us to get there in uh, a dozen years instead of uh, a 2000 or, or something like that. If we could figure that out, uh, then that would go a long way to at least being able to send something there to take a look. Uh, a probe at the very least. Uh, it certainly would be cheaper to send a probe four or five light years, which is a roughly the distance to Proxima, than to send a massive generation ship that has, uh, you know, humans, uh, human mass, biomass, everything necessary to make a self-sustaining uh, biosphere for a couple of millennia, or however long it actually takes to send uh, is such a large object that distance. And it's certainly going to have to go slower than something like, say, uh, say a, uh, a relatively light probe. Now, uh, it could also could spur on the development of the, uh, as a result, the technology necessary to actually make a viable colony, say, on the Moon or Mars. And uh, that also, uh, it, it's essentially the same technology we'd need for a generation ship. And it could also spur on the uh, exploration and possible development of resources, say, in the asteroid belt and uh, uh, in the uh, rings at Saturn and so on, so that we could have the raw material to build these types of spacecraft that we would, would have to be massive, so we'd have to build them in orbit somewhere. Uh, and that could only help industry as a whole because we'll end up with better and better extraction methods as a result. Uh, and it'll certainly even help mining down on, on the Earth's surface and, and that sort of thing. So uh, it could spur on technology if people get really excited about it and start pushing for this type of investment. Uh, although I don't hold my breath that that's going to happen, it could and it'd be really nice if it did. And it also gives fodder for the science fiction writers out there. It gives them something that's plausible to work with because now that we've seen this, uh, this makes things a lot more plausible. Uh, and, you know, granted, this is not a new idea of uh, telling a story of generation ships going to other stars and things like that. Uh, science fiction writers have been telling stories like that for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, you know, I read one that was written, uh, I don't remember when it was, but it was an old book. It was a novel, you know, 100 page novel from uh, the 40s or 50s or 60s or something like that. I picked up for a nickel. And uh, it was just that a generation ship going, I think it might have been Proxima, but uh, I can't remember for sure. And they got there and they found out a col other colonists had arrived ahead of them who had left later. And, and there's lots of possibilities for these types of stories. And it, but just having found something that could be an Earth-like planet at Proxima makes these things a lot more plausible. And that, I think, is a boon as well because it means there's less stuff in science fiction that's totally out there. Anyway, that's all I really want to say about this for now. So if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.